Okay, so I can already see the attendee list going up, uh, but uh, anyhow, we will uh, begin. So hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Wise uh, webinar of the month. I am Akanksha Singh, as most of you all know. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise, and uh, this webinar of the month will be uh, focusing on the food waste management in urban areas. So as you all know that we have been organizing such waste dialogues on monthly basis, uh, addressing the need for knowledge dissemination on waste management uh, since uh, 2013. Yes, it's been a decade that uh, we, Be Waste Wise, uh, uh, which is a non-profit organization, we've been bridging the gap, uh, the waste solutions expertise gap worldwide over a decade now. Uh, we started off with one moderator and today we have more than 12 moderators such as uh, Professor Dube who's uh, going to moderate this one, uh, who are uh, coming from different parts of the world and society and they're posing questions and teasing out insights and guiding conversations such as these with uh, many relevant, uh, you know, uh, panelists that we have uh, on a monthly basis, uh, which are uh, guiding these conversations and making such, uh, you know, uh, insights more relevant than any other online or offline platforms. We have more than 300 contributors as well who are taking part in this journey every year. So uh, if you see the value in making such diverse sustainability dialogues uh, free of charge to anyone and everyone, so we'd request you all to please support us in our mission. Every donation help us create, curate, and produce such waste dialogues on diverse topics. Uh, we encourage you all to please do check out our website and also our donation page. We will be sharing the link of the donation page over the chat as well. Now, moving on to the discussion today, we have uh, Professor Dube, who has been instrumental in guiding such waste dialogues and sharing insights for many years together now for our audiences. Uh, professor Dube is presently a professor, resource recovery and circular engineering at the Department of Civil Engineering, chair for School of Water Resources at IIT Kharagpur. He is very well known globally as a waste resource management and life cycle analysis and decarbonization expert. His research has been funded by several national and international agencies. Uh, today, Professor Dube, along with the esteemed panel, will explore how globally tackling food waste management is an urgent challenge demanding innovative solutions. And to address this topic, we have today on our panel, uh, Ms. Paramita Day, who is a city planner with over 25 years of uh, experience in urban development. She heads the Resources and Waste Unit at NIUA and is the program lead for the Sustainable Cities and Water Sanitation Program. Uh, she spearheaded the program on capacity building in sanitation and waste management as part of uh, Swachh Bharat uh, Mission 1.0. Uh, which was uh, by the government of India. And at presently, she is leading the capacity building initiative of uh, uh, Swaj Bharat Mission uh, 2.0. Uh, we have, on the other hand, Yashas Bhand, who is the CEO and whole time director at Organic Recycling Systems. He's a second generation entrepreneur with focus on technology, operations, and the social economic development of society. He has an MTech in biotechnology and solid waste management planning from UNESCO IHE. And at last, we do we have um, uh, Professor Ajay Kalamdar, who is working as a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Guwahati. His ma major research areas are solid waste management, composting, anaerobic, anaerobic uh, digestion, water quality, etc. He's published more than 250 international papers in peer-reviewed journals and presented his work at more than 300 national and international conferences and workshops. Now, before I uh, proceed further with this discussion, I would request you all to please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our uh, website and YouTube channel. We request you all to please use the Q&A function for all your queries to the panel. And uh, we encourage you all to use uh, this uh, Q&A function as much as possible to raise as many queries as possible to make the discussion even more fruitful and productive. Uh, use the chat function for all your comments, any uh, research uh, links that you want to share and also for networking. Uh, we request you all to please ensure that all your queries are going into Q&A and not on the chat so that we do not miss out on attending them. So back to the waste dialogue and over to you, Professor Dubey. 
Thank you. Thank you, Akansha, for uh, the introduction to all of us. So as Akansha mentioned, we are going to talk about food waste. See, ideally, we should not, in ideal world, there should not be any food waste. But unfortunately, that's not the case, isn't it? So because of uh, the issues where the, while we are generating the food on the agricultural farm, so we have some waste there itself. There is some waste along the transport system. There are some waste from the markets. And then now, finally, there is some waste from our houses as well. So together, we do produce a uh, like a very significant amount of food waste, as you can see in many reports and other things out there. So we have to address them. They are readily biodegradable materials, so they can contribute to global warming and all those aspects. But at the same time, they can be a very good resource material. So today's webinar will be focusing on how to make it as a resource material. What are the challenges associated with that? And uh, as uh, Akansha mentioned, we have very esteemed panel members. Uh, uh, Professor Kalamdar, who has been working in this for more than not more than 20 years and uh, very passionate about food waste. So he is the ideal candidate to start today's uh, deliberations. So without any further delay, uh, I would request Professor Kalamdar to have his opening remarks on uh, the topic of today's uh, webinar. Please, Professor Kalamdar. You are on mute, sir. Please unmute. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Professor Dubey. Uh, for having me there in this web webinar and uh, also uh, be waste wise you people are doing very well uh, to organize such kind of webinars uh, and i really was uh, lucky enough to have such kind of platform where especially you are talking on food waste uh, when you talk about waste management major challenges is on plastic uh, plastic waste or mostly people are talking on the recycling waste and when you talk about the exact Example, like most of the examples are coming from the European or American country, they especially talk on the recycling processes. Even they were there talking on the uh, disposal sites also. Uh, that now there are technical uh, uh, landfill sites are also is coming up now. But I think when you talk about especially South uh, South Asian countries or African countries, the major challenge is a food waste because once this food waste is reached to the dump site or the final disposal site. Uh, which is it is really creating that problem that leachate. I think everyone is uh, uh, known about that the leachate. I just share about the one pollutant. Uh, uh, we normally to, as a pollutant we are calculating that BOD five value. So you know the BOD five value is goes to 60, 65,000 milligram per liter. And once it will reach to the groundwater, many times I say even the god also can't be <laughs> treat that once it will reach to the aquifer in the groundwater and also the lot of gases also is coming out so the major challenge or major option or major uh, if any uh, ulb wants to have the proper waste management system the first and major uh, i think uh, thoughts i think they should have they should have banned this kind of food waste to reach into the dump site that is the first thought and if you see the india's that uh, uh, Swachh Bharat Mission, the major target was given to the ULBs also, how best they can stop these, bio, these food waste to, uh, is, should not reach into the disposal site. It's now, how we can do that? I think if we have the proper decentralized plants, because centralized plants is very working, uh, working is very difficult. Because when you talk about the food waste, uh, is a, as Professor uh, Dubey also was saying, highly uh, degradable. That's why it is creating a lot of issue when you are trying to go for composting process is very challenging because the leachate production again will get start in the, I think many of the, the private, I think, uh, uh, also will explain that, the, that, that challenges. So there, I think, I think major challenges is to have the, how best we can get, get have the decentralized facilities. Either that could be possible as a compost facility. And when you especially talk about the Asian countries or African country, we really require that compost facilities because our agriculture system also is purely depend on, depend on that chemical fertilizer. If it is possible, at least that 10%, 20%, we can feel, we will be remove that uh, uh, the chemical fertilizer and we can replace by this compost. That is also very good for the any country. Uh, uh, to manage the nitrogen concentration in the soil because uh, because now every country is also worried about the nitrogen concentration in the agriculture uh, soil 
So in, in this way, I think this food waste can be a, one of the very good resource also. If it is not possible to run the, your local condition is not allowing the uh, compost facility. So why not what uh, the, you, uh, the Germany has done? Germany in 70s, 80s, 90s, they had a lot of bio biomethyl plants they have started. And even they got very good success where the local condition was not very good enough. But still, I think they got very good success on the bio CNG production. So why not? I think India also has started now, I think that way, the, uh, the, the production of bio CNG. But this bio CNG, you can't go in the very small scale. At least that uh, 10 tons, 20 tons, 30 tons uh, capacity plants is able to produce at least a small amount of that bio CNG. At least the, uh, the, the that kind of thoughts, I think, is very 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 beneficial and uh, because of that only we will we won't, we can ban or we can at least allow, not allowing that food waste to reach into the dump site so i personally believe that and uh, i think maybe we can start the discussion in this way only okay, how best we can reduce the waste at the dumping site and uh, and they uh, uh, i think if you start in that way then the discussion will start how best we can treat in the decentralized way Either the decentralized way in the locality wise, if it is possible. Now the transfer station also has come up in India or South Asian country. People are talking on. So why not that we can combine with the transfer station, this compost facility, either the compost facility or biogas facility. That is one way. Uh, someone I think will be also interested to know about that. Sir, why to go on the locality way? Why not in the upper, our residential apartment, if it is having the small facility of compost facility or biogas facility, why not that could be a, one of the way we can have. So many, even the uh, many ULBs also, when they are calling me, I'm asking them, don't give the, uh, uh, the permission for the construction until unless they have the compost facility. Uh, a compose, rather than saying the compost facility, uh, you share that the, the local authority or the collection crew does not allow you to collect the or dispose the food waste. Dry waste is very easy to treat. I, I can say share that. And that is the major challenge for the recycling facility. And most of the developing countries learning number of uh, informal sectors, they are very good in the recycling one. So if you are uh, reducing that food waste mixed with the, uh, uh, the dry waste, I think they will also be, will get benefited. So I especially like that when someone is saying that food waste could be a very good resource, uh, could be possible for any country. I think with that, I think we can start the discussion followed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Kalamdar. Very nice uh, uh, like, uh, thought, like nice uh, points at the very beginning. So taking this decision further, uh, I would now request uh, Madam Paramita Day uh, to talk about uh, like, see, uh, talk about the aspects of food reduction and also some of uh, possible good practices which is uh, happening in India in some cities. So Professor, uh, Ms. Ms. Day, your, uh, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dubey. Just give me a minute, please. Sure. Can yes. you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, put it on slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, go okay, ahead. thanks to WasteWise and thanks to Professor Dube for having me here. And thanks to all of you for spending, getting out time to listen to us. So I uh, wanted to focus on <clears throat> food waste and the difference between food loss and food waste. And why in India we need... Uh, on one hand, of course, we are talking about, about the food waste and its treatment. On the other hand, I think we it's high time that we focused on reduction of food waste. So I'd like to focus my uh, short PPT on that. So if we look at food loss and food waste, food loss basically refers to the decrease in the quantity or quality of food waste that is intended for human consumption. Whereas food waste typically occurs at the retail and consumer level, where food is discarded rather than consumed. And a lot of times it's due to factors like over-purchasing, 
uh, you know, expiry date coming close or for cosmetic imperfections. Now, if you look at some of the statistics, you'll be surprised to know that 32% of all the food produced is wasted between the farm to fork. And this accounts for about $940 billion of annual economic loss. And generation of food waste, of course, is on the rise due to our lifestyle changes. <clears throat> and this results in, of course, significant losses of all precious resources like water, land, manpower and energy. Now, uh, if you look at some of the statistics worldwide, we see that India is next only to China and it has a rank of 50. Uh, uh, and we, sorry, it is a uh, second rank and on an uh, average, India discards about 6.8 crore tons of total waste in a year which accounts for 50 kg of food waste per capita. So it's a huge number. And with our demographic dividend of young people and focus on uh, fast moving consumer products, this is only going to rise. And according to uh, international statistics, if this continues, then we will likely increase from less than 40,000 tons per year to 125,000 tons by 2030. So the impact, of course, is well known. Uh, many of you in the audience are, uh, you know, in working in this area. So these are some statistics to just highlight. And India's commitment as per the SDG is there with respect to SDG 2 and SDG 12. And there are a number of uh, policies and, uh, you know, uh, huge, uh, programs uh, that are there in place to reduce uh, food waste. But what I guess is missing is the convergence and a consolidated effort. So if we look at uh, challenges, uh, it's a complex task. First of all, reducing retail and supply chain waste is a very big task because in retail, um, uh, there is a lot of times the inventory is not properly managed. There's overstocking, there's inadequate storage facilities which leads to spoilage, which leads to expiration, disposal of a lot of edible uh, food products. And on the other hand, we are a country with high malnutrition levels. So it's actually a paradox. Then reducing food waste service. Uh, this also faces several uh, uh, challenges, like there is no consistent portioning. If you, you know, some restaurants will give you a lot of food with a particular amount, some will give you less, so there is no standardization. In terms of, uh, we may think that, you know, we, we have our domestic help and in the household level, we are not wasting food. But in reality, we are, and it just doesn't come out. This also has a lot of economic factors that is food pricing and subsidies. Uh, this also a lot of times leads to wastage of food. Data management challenges, of course, whether we, whatever sector we are talking about, data is key and we are not collecting properly disaggregated data so that we can design our policies. We also have regulatory and uh, legislative challenges, whether it is due to weak enforcement or it could be due to non-compliance. Communication is a big thing because we normally take this for granted, but uh, communication plays a very, very big role here you know if we have if you go to any birthday party you see children wasting food they will read it in books that you are not supposed to waste but we we are very bad at going from policy to practice or preaching to practice i would say transportation of course uh, if there's not proper infrastructure a lot of food is get, gets waste on the way and government purchase and redistribution scheme due to overlapping of administration and access to, and there's a gray and the black market. So that also creates a lot of uh, challenges. Now, in terms of treatment, I will not focus as much. My other panelists have, are going to talk about it, but the main key areas, if you look at anaerobic digestion of food, a lot of time anaerobic digesters, particularly uh, whether it's sent, uh, at the small scale one, a lot of times there's a lot of maintenance and operation issues. Composting of food is happening in a very big way. 
But uh, if you look at bulk waste generators, a lot of times it's not happening. If you look at social gatherings, there's a lot of food that gets wasted. Incineration of food is the worst thing that can happen. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of waste to energy plants that are now coming up and food is getting incinerated, whether we like it or not. We have diverse waste stream and segregation at source. Again, all those Swachh Bharat mission is focusing a lot on segregation of waste at source, but it is easier said than done. So then contamination of food occurs due to plastic packaging, which cannot be a lot of time separated from the food. Transportation and logistics is there, infrastructure investment, and there are a lot of health and safety concerns due to mixing of food waste with other kind of waste, whether it is uh, domestic hazardous waste or it is your sanitary waste, because in uh, cases where segregation of food is not happening, then treatment is affected by unsegregated waste. So there are a number of key actors. There's the government, there are the business stakeholders, there are farmers, there are consumers, and there's the civil society. What each one is playing a role here what is basically missing is a coordination among all stakeholders in order to, uh, you know, in order for policies and programs to be implemented. Now, if we look at some international uh, cases, Germany has a very strict uh, legislation to reduce food waste. Canada has an app that connects business with surplus food. These are some of the international good practices that I came across. Sweden has tax incentives to repurpose food into biogas. Australia has come up with a lot of res rescue programs that collect surplus food. In India, we are doing it, but it's all very, very small efforts. There is not enough consolidation of efforts that's happening. And in Denmark, they have focused a lot on consumer awareness uh, about food waste. So, I mean, we may argue that we have a huge population, so it's not really comparable, but it's always good to learn from what the rest of the world is doing. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, laws and regulations in India, we have the FSSI uh, that has food safety standards. We have a draft policy. We have the compulsory food reduction bill. We have a social platform that was started by FSSI, and then we have the National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, I added some case studies, but I think for some reason, uh, those slides have got hidden. So I'll just say, uh, just share that with you. In India, there's something called the Feeding India Mission, which is more of a philanthropic um, uh, example where, uh, in the edible excess food is collected by a, by an organization for, uh, that has launched a program called Feeding India Mission. And they have something called a magic truck. They call, basically it is a refrigerated vehicle where they are collecting food and then they're redistributing it into small uh, schools uh, for school children. Then there is something called the Robin Hood Army uh, in uh, Bhopal, it started in Bhopal and they've now expanded to 103 cities. So it is an app-based approach where they, there is these young volunteers, they have made an app and the bulk uh, food waste generators, before the food becomes waste, with, when it is fresh and edible and can be uh, given out to others. Uh, so they get a, a notification on the app and then these volunteers go to these hotels and restaurants and they are distributing it to uh, old age homes and uh, you know orphanages and places like that. Uh, and now they are expanding to outside India as well. Then there is something called the Roti uh, Bank in uh, Maharashtra where uh, it's a project uh, with an NG, with that an NGO uh, is doing with the Dabbawala Association of Mumbai. We all know about the Dabbawala Association. It has made, uh, it's a case study for many international uh, business schools. So what happens here is there's a call center. That it's very similar to uh, the Robin Hood Army model. There's a call, but here it's a more organized and a larger scale one. There's a call center, you receive a call from the donor, 
then the, there are drivers who go and collect it there's a food bank where it is sorted and stored and through the dabba walas it is uh, being distributed to uh, people uh, and this is mostly in uh, uh, health centers where there are patients but the attendants are not do not always especially poor people the attendants do not always have access to good quality hygienic food so it is meant for them so it is meeting the social uh, goals it is meeting environmental goals it is meeting economic goals so um <clears throat> uh, so this leads us to think that why don't we have a national strategy in india to reduce food waste so so the hurdles here are we don't have a comprehensive legislation though we have talked though the fssi has put forward the idea but there is no legislation it's more like an advisory and even the advisory there's limited enforcement there's, we don't have disaggregated data because unless we have dis uh, disaggregated data we cannot plan there is inadequate infrastructure the incentives are all fragmented there are a lot of csr it's mostly philanthropic and csr initiative but they are not institutionalized there's lack of incentive uh, for doing these kind of efforts and of course awareness of the consumer is greatly missing and the focus on redistribution is also missing so if we look at a strategy what we need is a legal measure and we need a comprehensive approach where all the stakeholders that i talked about come together uh we need to prioritize waste prevention reduction and recycling over disposal so currently in swachh bharat mission uh, we work a lot with ulbs and everybody is focusing more on food after it has become waste how to treat it how to dispose it we need effective models for food banks and food recovery programs currently the cost is high and the innovative models are not that many and uh, of course collaboration i talked about and we also need quality norms uh, and there is a lot of edible but imperfect food that also gets wasted in india it was not like that earlier even in our mandis now the edible but imperfect food lot of times towards the end of the day in the mandi it is being sold at a cheaper price but as we are becoming more of a consumerist kind of a nation in the malls and all if you see you see food you know in plastic uh, it is wrapped in those uh, cling films and and the good looking ones only people buy and the other get wasted i don't know where i haven't really talked to them and asked them what do they do but i assume that it is being thrown away same is in all the safal centers we have a huge network of the mother dairy safal outlets and uh, i just did some uh, looked up some statistics and it says on an average a safal branch disposes food items of 18.7 kg per day so this this comes to about 7.5 tons of food that is thrown away every day at their 400 safal stores only in delhi and about 84.7% was thrown into the dustbin and the rest was given to some animals so as a way forward i feel community engagement infrastructure planning food redistribution data collection and sustainability these are the keys to having an action plan and a strategy on food waste thank you thank you thank you uh, ms day for a quite comprehensive uh, presentation so uh, without taking any further delay since uh, just to keep the time uh, i would request uh, mr bhan uh, he who is uh, running a company uh, managing food waste uh, so we would like to hear your experience of uh, what are the do's and don'ts if somebody is starting a company because you will get a lot of questions uh, after your presentation there will be a lot of questions coming up how to set up a plan and uh, what you the barriers or the challenges that you are facing uh, and what could be some practical approach to solve those so please go ahead uh, it, uh, the floor is yours yeah thank you professor thank you bves wise for uh, having me and giving me this this uh, opportunity Uh, so let me uh, break down uh, uh, you know the food waste management from the perspective at ulb level uh, from the technology standpoint 
if the first point uh, is the selection of the technology with respect to the methodology whether you have to go for decentralized processing or whether you have to go for centralized processing because many times it happens that the ulb is a bit confused and it generally comes on the city level planning uh, that because of the say area restrictions or say for example the waste collection process they are not able to uh, prepare the plan properly and they get confused whether to go with uh, you know decentralized approach or centralized approach and most of the time it happens that whatever the mandate comes from the center as per the policy they tend to follow that so for example i'll give you 2016 guidelines when they came in the msw guideline it was written that the bulk generators have to uh, process their uh, waste at the source which was a very good thing because segregation happens it also helps in managing the dry waste properly it so that the contamination of the dry waste doesn't happen but one of the few challenges that happened was that these uh, ulbs didn't understand the technical aspect of it depending on the quantity depending on the uh, feedstock characteristics for example i'll give you uh, as uh, you know uh, uh, madam dev mentioned about anaerobic digestion and maintenance of these smaller plants the decentralized plants what used to happen is and it has happened way back i mean i would say since the start of these decentralized processing even before the 2016 guideline is say for example the supply of the quantity of the waste because anaerobic digestion process or for that matter composting requires a steady flow of waste as well in terms of quantity and quality if there is a huge variation of 20 30% every day then obviously the uh, digester or composting process is going to get affected and eventually the uh, outputs are going to get affected so that was also one of the challenge uh, that you know we faced third part is the segregation obviously in terms so so coming to the second point so one was the 2016 guidelines where the decentralized approach was there but slowly it also got fizzled out i'll be very honest we have as a company installed various decentralized processes but unfortunately when you hand it over to the ulb either they don't have the technical know how to operate it or and eventually these plants are shut what is the solution for that that they need to have a uh, uh, skill manpower understand from uh, you know companies like us and other technical experts subject matter experts who know how to operate this get aligned with universities with technical subject matter expert to understand how these needs to be run so there needs to be a very uh, strong skill development at the ulb level for running these decentralized processes uh third point i would say uh, uh, oh, sorry uh, coming back to uh, you know the second point of it uh, the centralized processing now since the uh, you know start of satat and the whole biofuel policy where we want to reduce the uh, you know import of uh, oil and have it replaced by bio cng now what are the challenges when it comes to centralized processing plant the challenge of the centralized processing plant is the receipt of your segregated waste obviously for example a very good example is indore but why it has been successful because of a very strong uh, implementation methodology of the policy at on the segregation level and collection transportation and that is why indore has been uh, you know uh, uh, successful in delivering the segregated waste obviously there would be 10 20% of inert but that is managed another methodology is that you provide different segregation line specifically because there are certain depending on the city to city it might happen that you cannot have decentralized solutions for example let us case uh, take the case of mumbai in mumbai because the land prices are very high it so happens that while they come out with tenders the corporation come out with tenders they find it difficult to install these plant uh, because of the area restriction but they have large scale areas or dumping areas that are available which are in hundreds of acres and therefore they prefer centralized location but their challenge again with the 7000 8000 tons of waste coming in uh, you know segregation or collection transportation becomes difficult so there has to be a segregation line or exhaustive segregation line which ensures that the waste is segregated the organic is recovered and it is sent to these bio cng plants which makes it viable another uh, challenge uh, that we have seen is the application of the by product specifically in the ulb areas uh, say for example uh, 
few examples i'll give you say for example the composting at uh, household levels or uh, at community levels uh, for example these 24 hour composters or general general composting methodology of the quantities it used to happen that the corporation used to mandate mandate the ulbs or bulk generators to do composting as the compost generation increased they had storage problem obviously because the application of compost you cannot do it every day on potted plants or in that area right so they need to have connections with uh, you know nurseries to have it but they also find it difficult because there was no awareness with these nurseries to put it what is the right way that the ulb for these decentralized plant should extend the support to take back this compost and utilize in their gardens or store it so that and or sell it further because they do have that network at a subsidized rate which adds to their revenue that is one of the solutions second challenge uh, uh, you know on the byproduct side is the application in terms of uh, you know electricity sometimes it used to happen now obviously net metering has come in but in the earlier stages it used to happen that the say for example the biogas plant used to run it used to produce power but in the local area the connections or that kind of uh, facility or infrastructure was not there but the plant was established there were certain cases like this what is the solution yes the net metering has come into play now where you can uh, you know uh, directly supply it into the grid and get it offset as far as the application of cng in you you will be areas is there obviously it's a win win situation because the cng vehicles uh, numbers are going to increase in coming times and if once these plants are established uh, you know the uh, take up uh, take off of this uh, compressed biogas is going to be 100% including your injection into the city gas distribution network uh, so i would i would like to end here on the uh, you know note that uh, yes there are challenges there are challenges but as as a country we are moving very forward we are moving very quickly also one of the major thing that we need to do is technically scaling the ulbs workforce that is the most important thing and also generating skilled workforce for operation of these plants and third creating a network to pick up compost and other by products that come out because it is very critical I, another example i'll give you we have these large scale composting plants in cities uh, the challenge it comes is that they want to give it to uh fertilizer companies but the fertilizer companies obviously through the distribution network uh, send it to rural areas where the application is huge because if you are generating 50 60 tons of compost every day it cannot be utilized within the city it needs to go to the rural areas where the agriculture is being done and therefore the transportation cost increases so as i said the government needs to come over here to create a network where there is a specific department or an authority to focus on marketing and selling of the city compost being generated either through composting facilities or through biogas plants it cannot be part of the fertilizer industries or be as as of now it is mandated for fertilizer industries to buy these plant uh, but obviously they uh, uh, also have their mandate to sell their components of uh, fertilizer so it gets with very tricky that what needs to be sold off so the, these were the points that i would like to highlight and uh, end my uh, you know uh, submissions on this sir thank you thank you mr bhan for a uh, good uh, like a very pertinent thoughts from the application point of view on the ground so we have uh, several questions already which uh, many of this uh, professor uh, kalamdar uh, has already answered but we will still get more questions so i'll get started uh, a general question with professor kalamdar first and then others can also chime in see uh, we many times professor kalandar when we go to some meetings especially with ulbs they have a question is uh, when we say it's centralized versus decentralized so they said uh, where is the line uh, like what how small should be the decentralized are we talking about 1 watt 2 watt and uh, of course it uh, depends on the economy of the scale for different technology so your thoughts on that the how one one ulb can decide where is the where to what how to define decentralized yeah please go ahead so uh, thank you thank you for this question and uh, i also believed that uh, mr bhand had already had a lot of discussion with ulb and this question is very common question so i always share about that if any city wants to have the success waste management or even food waste management every city can't have the same way 
I think I I always share about the corporation. See, where these apartments are constructing, their treatment is different. So they should have their own decentralized facility. Like you take example of Mumbai, there are a lot of big, big apartments are coming up. Dola or these some construction companies. They have almost, I think, 5,000 population or 10,000 population community. So these kind of people, they should have their own because they already started the sewage treatment plant. Small lower, uh, the uh, one uh, MLD plant, two MLD sewage treatment plant. Already they are treating the sewage. So why not, why not I think they can treat their waste themselves and utilize in the, their own area. That is the first thing they should have. Second thing in the commercial area, I think uh, already in Chennai, they, I think there's a long back one uh, biogas unit was working. In their, uh, food, uh, their food market, they had a the uh, one proper biogas plant so that the entire electricity they can produce from the, that bio, biogas plant. I think and Indoor also, see Indoor has not come up directly that 500 tons. The first plant, I think they have started with that 1800 tons per, 18 tons per day plant. That is very close to the uh, uh, food, food market because they were easy to get it, uh, receive that particular waste. I think that, I think this is how I think we have to segregate. And it's not like that 100% we can reduce within these five years. I think your target has to be like, uh, like 10 10 years, 15 years. So slowly, I think, so what our manual also say that CPHO manual uh, is published by ministry. They never says that within a one year or within two years, you could come up with the entire solution. It's not possible. Yeah. So what uh, Mr. Bhand also was saying that ULB also do not have the technological information. So because see, every locality, take example of India, see African conditions are completely different. Uh, so most of the literature we're finding from the European country or American country where they don't they don't require compost also or they don't uh, condition is not allowing them to produce that. But especially for South Asian country or Middle East country or African country where very good local conditions are there for the compost one. And rather than the uh, having the literature from their own, every ELB has to run by, run from their own plants. One small plant in the uh, food waste market, one plant, see that six month, one year, get the experience, uh, put it in one of the residential area and just learn the learn in that way. Okay, how that uh, plants are running, what are the challenges are there, run from your own facility, then you slowly you go in that one. Maybe your entire uh, you will be 100% all the locality you can't touch. Maybe few watts will the decentralized facility, maybe some of the watt or half of the watts could be a centralized facility where the uh, proper land is not available. Maybe their collection will be there and one centralized facility could be possible. But that centralized facility doesn't allow the entire waste from the city. So this small, small uh, thing, maybe I think if you talk to some of the residents, they really wants to, they do not want to dispose their waste or especially food waste to the uh, crew member, they don't want to allow to collect. So why not? I think we can propose then to, some benefits to the those people who who are having their own vermi composting unit, small vermi composting unit, or in a any apartment they can come up with small unit. They should get some benefits from the local authority also, so that the promotion also could be possible. So this is what I am I am I am thinking about the ULB. They, they none of the ULB in the any world they can come up within one year or two year any yeah. solution. So with their own experiences they have to learn, and the entire solution could not be a same for the entire area. Maybe some of the area the solution could be something. Some of the area could solution could be something else. This is my yeah. view. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Very very nice. I agree. Like uh, see. Some places you may not be able to sell compost, so you have to may have to go for biogas also or bio CNG. So uh, there was a uh, co comment uh, from one of the participants. Uh, see, and then I think I would ask uh, Ms. Paramita to kind of take that first. See, people are uh, having a negative approach about the waste management. So basically, I think she's talking about that. Although the rule says do the source segregation, but we mix it together. We don't want we generate the waste, but we don't want to touch the waste. 
So what, uh, of course, Indoor has uh, some examples is there, but you have worked with some other, I know that you have worked with some other cities in India too. So how to uh, tackle this behavioral issue, which is always does any waste management discussion, discussion comes, uh, they do come up with this question, like how to make people follow the rules, including, uh, I see that problem even in our campus. <laughs> we are not able to get source segregated waste from uh, faculty and, uh, how, and staff housing. So please, uh, uh, Ms. Day, you are on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Please. So uh, I think here uh, it's about awareness raising. So, and awareness raising is uh, uh, with my experience, with whatever little experience that I have, is it has worked where the elected representative and the administrative representatives of a city or a ULB have worked together. So if you look at the story of Indore or Ambikapur or Lonavla, the umpteen number of cases, here they always had a very passionate uh, commissioner, but just having a passionate municipal commissioner is not enough unless and until the mayor or the chairperson of the city puts in equal effort and owns up to the fact that it's my city, I have to get it clean. So if a faith leader or a mayor or a chairperson or a very well-known school teacher, so we have to identify some uh, people that uh, in the city, in, in, it would vary from city to city, whom people look up to. And if they say that the waste is not waste, but I mean, there's a lot of controversy about waste being called a resource or not. But even if we say it is my waste and it's the kura wala and not the safai wala, the change of perspectives, why we are calling them safai mitras and not kura wala, because they are cleaning our waste. So they are actually the cleaning people, not the waste people. So it's about perspectives. And perspectives can change when somebody you look up to or you believe in tells you or points out to uh, points those nuances out to you. So even uh, so, that was about Indore. Now, if you look at Ambikapur, which is a small city in Chhattisgarh, that managed waste through uh, primarily two or three key things that they did. One was, of course, very very well-organized source segregation, but it did not happen overnight. So they, the story of Ambikapur is such that it was the commissioner who uh, saw, uh, you know, over TV, she saw an example of a city where they had managed to do their waste management through very uh, me meager means. They did not have enough money. They did not have enough land. But she got that person to talk about it. That was the first thing. The other thing she did was, the federation into self-help groups. So she, she federated, there were self-help groups available, she trained them. And one of the things while they had people uh, who said that they are willing to work for waste, they were told you're not going to be working for waste as in kura or kachra, you'll be working in uh, industrial sheds. So they called something called SLRM, Solid Liquid Resource Management Center. And it is these SLRMs which were, which were basically MRFs, material recovery facility, where they were sorting the waste into a certain number of categories. And then it went to a tertiary center. So it's about perspectives. It's about who tells you what to do. So that is what will change. And secondly, you have to be very patient because behavior change is easier said than done. And it's a long process. And you have to keep doing it. You have to keep badgering and nudging people. That the continuous nudge is very important. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that perspective. Uh, uh, Mr. Pan, there are a couple of questions for you in the, the Q&A. Of course, uh, uh, one question is what could be the approximate capex and opex cost of anaerobic digestion composting technology for the rural community? which has around uh, 500 to 800 kg of organic waste per day. And then I can, if I add another question, you're talking about that uh, startups might be a good solution to reduce the challenges of selling products of organic waste, like uh, some, like having multiple startups getting together and, and working on different aspects of it. So your thoughts on that? Uh, right. So I'll take the first question, uh, though it's, to be very honest, it is subjective because there are various technologies now, yeah. uh, you know, you have containerized, you have portable systems, you have the uh, 
KVIC system. So generally, a 500 to 800 kg will range somewhere around, uh, uh, you know, uh, 12 lakhs, and it can go up to somewhere around 20, 25 lakhs, depending on, uh, you know, the uh, technology that you are or the party that you are choosing. Uh, coming on to the second point, uh, yes, startups can help a lot. For example, I am aware of one of uh, the startups in Mumbai who specifically collects uh, organic fraction from the hotels for which they charge the hotel as well. And because of this, what happens is that the processing facilities that are there within the, say, for example, in the wards as well, or on the centralized location, receives the segregated waste. So it's a very win-win situation, wherein the collection is also happening on segregated level and also going further to the processing uh, and the processing cost also reduces because the segregation does uh, need not happen at the processing facility. So uh, basically, the startups need to be there on the collection transportation side uh, is what I feel so that the segregation happens uh, uh, much more efficiently. And second, obviously, there's a huge scope on in terms of technology development. Uh, for example, there is one technology which uh, I've been hearing a lot is the conversion of uh, food waste into animal feed. So there's a process of pasteurization and other things. I'm I, I'm not aware as of now. I've not read too much, but I've just come across these uh, details. So that is also one of the space where you know startups can look at. Uh, as I said, application of the byproducts. The products are sometimes difficult. So once you have certain uh, processes where the products are easier to sell, then it's a win-win situation. So startups can look into that uh, 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 sector also. Yeah, so we do have at IIT Kharagpur campus, we have a biofly project where the food okay. waste collected from the hostels is fed to those larvae and then when they become big, they're around 55% protein and it is wow. hatched okay. and uh, used as a fish feed. We are in Bengal, so a lot of fisheries uh, around. Right. So it's used as a fish feed or, uh, or people use it for piggeries and other places too. Piggeries even they take the raw food waste uh, there too. Uh, so, so, right. cool. yeah. so that's a good... Uh, uh, so, getting into other uh, aspect of it, see, uh, 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 Professor Kalamdar, uh, see, we talk about compost, we talk about biogas, but uh, in the literature, and you mentioned earlier that we get literature only from uh, North America or Europe, thanks to the effort of uh, your lab and some labs like that, we are getting now a good number of literature from India too. So, we should appreciate uh, your effort on that part. But uh, coming to, uh, the, what, are, what about the other technologies? See, we do see technologies in terms of making some hydrochar or making some different value added products uh, from food waste. Even people are looking at the recovery of biopolymer, recovery of different chemicals and other stuff, making bioplastics. So where do you see, like, do you see those uh, in terms of practically those plants coming on the ground? Like, uh, what's your thought on that? We see the papers in different journals, but what about uh, actual plants seeing on the ground? Yeah, please. No, until now, I think those kind of technology, uh, other than compost and biogas, mostly is in the lab scale only. Yeah, let's go. Uh, uh, see, polymer is uh, one, one very important area to work. Uh, even I, we tried in our lab, we have one center on sustainable polymer. Our target was to produce some kind of biopolymer out of that, which could be easily degradable one. But uh, it was very difficult. Uh, and the what the product we have come up with that, uh, maybe the small plates I think we had created, but uh, the density was so low, uh, it was not handled to, to produce. And we didn't continue that kind of study. Other one like biochar is very common now and it's very popular now. Even though if you talk to the farmers also, they are also very well aware about the biochar production. Now, when you talk about the biochar, now the entire technology will change. Now, there won't be any compost or this one. Now, see, in India, actually, India or even mostly the Asian countries, people are not talking more on pyrolysis of MSW. That is one thing see, everyone has to understand now. I think that research, even one of my students, we have started that, uh, that work now, uh, the biochar production or char production. Both is not only from the food waste, but from MSW also, why can't we can generate the char out of that? And that doesn't require the much temperature in the pyrolysis process. Now, the problem is that we can't scale up those kind of facility. That is the one challenge. I'm trying that in maybe 
uh, next i think 6 month we'll have one small uh, now currently we have one small pyrolyzer uh, which can feed 6 kg in a one single uh, and the cost is only 50000 rupees which we have created and we're hoping that uh, we could have one of the unit where at least that 20 kg or 25 kg one pyrolyzer which can generate very good quality biochar either biochar or even char from the dry waste i think that is also very getting very popularized what someone is asking about that uh, startup see yeah. what uh, professor dubey also was shared about that in uh, uh, organic startups uh, i think youtube you will find a lot of videos uh, some lady is getting 25 20 lakhs 25 lakh by selling the compost see compost can't be sellable in india until unless you 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 can ban the, that agriculture fertilizer that is the major challenge it is not possible it is not and you can't compare the compost with the fertilizer see urea have nitrogen concentration is 40 percent in your compost and when you see the uh, fco standard of compost is 0.8 or maximum one percent of uh, nitrogen concentration so if someone is saying ki we can replace the compost with chemical fertilizer not possible and i'm really i i but i think our farmers also are very well trained they knew that uh, especially for the vegetable grow or flower production farmers they are already utilizing the compost but they are not uh, purchasing because they have the 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 cattle manu ca cattle waste is already there with them a lot of agriculture residues they are generating they, they they themselves they are doing it that is not the problem of ulb now the ulb has see ulb can't target that the biochar production see whether I think what uh, Mr. Bhand also was saying, I think the yeah, system is not integrated. When you say the integrated waste management, you're, I think when you are talking about segregation at source, when you are talking about segregation of source, you should have one compost facility. Otherwise, it's not, your segregation can't be beneficial. So this is how the integration is required. Your all functional elements like start from the segregation, transportation. If if it is that the, when you are talking about the proper uh, segregated waste transportation, you should have one recycling facility, one location, another location, one compost facility or biogas facility. So what is happening is most of the schemes in India, some project is specially for the collection only. So, and some, some of the schemes are specially for having the compost facility or some of the project for the biogas. What Mr. Bhand was saying, na? see, most of the program to have one bio CNG plant, but that, that particular scheme, scheme, uh, scheme or policy doesn't talk about the collection of waste. So both has to be worked together. So ULB also has to learn that if they are getting some kind of fund from the central government to have some kind of facility, either biogas facility or compost facility, they have to also understand that your collection has to be 100% on the segregated way. So why those plants are not running right now? What uh, Bhand also was saying about that uh, Satat one, Satat has proper target about, uh, about that. Uh, so only the industry people can do that. ULB is very difficult, very challenging for that. So until unless they have the integrated system is very difficult. And what your question again, I, I reply into the small uh, uh, way like we should again, I think when especially when you are uh, in the South Asian country, go ahead with the compost, produce compost. Uh, maybe I think other issues we can handle later on. Uh, if it is not possible for compost, at least go for bio CNG production. This is getting very popularized now nowadays. And don't take the example of that 500 tons per day. Just see that indoor 20 tons per day, 18 tons per day. If it is not possible 20 tons, run that 10 tons per day. Or uh, even not possible, 5 tons per day capacity plant. At least run those facility. You'll get good amount of energy out of that. So just to uh, just take a question came, which is kind of related to what you're just saying right now. Uh, the, Sujata is asking that how feasible is to build localized infrastructure versus the transportation to a central a centralized processing facility. So, of course, you have to look at the transportation cost and all that. It's uh, 
Uh, that's uh, uh, that's not actually when the, the decentralized composting or decentralized treatment facility, why it got uh, popularized because it is reducing your collection cost or transportation costs, uh, which is the maximum fund we're utilizing for collection and transportation. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Pand, uh, uh, just to uh, to give you also mentioned somewhere in your initial thought about the 24 hour composter, is it really? Can we really have a 24 hour composter? Like always uh, as a as a waste management researcher, I always get worried when we hear that term. So yeah, please go ahead. So you know my answer already, I'm sure. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> that's a, it. It, as, I, as I said, that one of the challenge when this whole, because, 2016 guideline came in, uh, you know, uh, and it was mandated for bulk generators and societies to process. The ULBs took it in a very, uh, you know, right way, obviously, to implement it. But they tried to put everything on the societies and bulk generators, basically. And that is where this whole, uh, you know, the discovery of 24-hour composting happened. Uh, obviously, there was claim that there are bacteria within 24 hours which digest. Uh, I'm not sure if that happens. I mean, everything would be degraded outside itself in 24 hours. You, don't need you would have, you know, your biogas retention would be just one day. Yes. Right? So, a lot of things that has happened. But I think now people have also realized that this 24-hour composting is not a way to go ahead. As I mentioned also, that because of that, you had this kind of byproducts coming in, which was not being utilized and eventually it was being dumped or being thrown. So, so now it is not happening. And people have also understood that. The ULBs have also understood it. And now they are uh, moving towards, you know, conventional composting or composting where uh, they are doing the curing part also. They are doing the size reduction. They are giving a heat treatment. And then they are going for a curing period of 15, 20 days. That is what is happening, which I am aware of. Okay. But, uh, so there are a couple of more questions. As I said, that we do get a lot of questions here. Uh, so there was one question with uh, Ms. Day, if you want to, uh, the talking about the food loss. So there is a thought from Maria said that uh, if we can produce food in a community level uh, planting plant, where there is a diversity of product planted to minimize overproduction of the same product so that we don't get this food loss. Uh, but I think food loss happens because we don't have proper storage and all that. But uh, if you want to talk about that, or what are the ways we can minimize food loss? That's what uh, she's asking. So yeah, you're right. Uh, food loss happens more because of lack of good transportation facility or storage uh, facility. But there is a lot of uh, thinking now about urban uh, uh, urban farms where you can grow your food close to your home with a diversity of crops. And it's also to address climate change because if uh, certain, cr certain crops are susceptible to climate change. So uh, you lose out on a lot of food. So having diversity, but in India, we are uh, we are very, I would say we are in a very nascent state when we are talking about urban, uh, urban farms. Uh, but yes, it is a good idea. But for that, a lot of consumer awareness needs to be built. And how many of us actually have the time or the passion to grow our own food? So it requires a lot of, uh, I mean, it can be done at the community level, but it requires a good amount of capacity building, training and awareness, I would say. Okay, so thank you. So I think we have, uh, so last question maybe to all the panelists from my side. is see, ultimately, there is a lot of uh, talk on decarbonization, isn't it? So reducing the carbon footprint, meeting the net zero. So I look at food waste also a good uh, area where we can, if you have this uh, proper uh, food waste management practices so that we don't contribute to methane and CO2. If you don't manage it properly, it will go to methane and CO2. So can we repackage our, because that's, that's a, right now, if you talk about net zero, can we repackage our food waste discussion from a net zero perspective to grab the attention of the policy makers and possibly attract the, some R and D, R and D as well as demonstration projects on the ground. So maybe you start with Professor Karanda, uh, and then others can uh, chime in. No, I always uh, believe that. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think many people are asking me, sir, what is the, the prerequisite of uh, proper waste management? 
So everyone is answered like is a segregation is a prerequisite. But now if it is segregation also, until unless you have the compost facility or biogas facility, it is not possible to have that one. And again, I am uh, same same thing. I am sharing that. Uh, I think until unless uh, you have the one particular plant is running in the, any city, chota chota small plants. If it is not running, it is not accepted. It is very difficult to go forward. And uh, I think right now we do not have that kind of literature also available. Truly, I am saying that even the as an academician also. We can't extend our facility. So just to share with you, currently in my lab, I'm feeding around 300, 400 kg waste in the compost facility and biogas facility. That is very challenging, very, very challenging as an academician. So we need like uh, Mr. Bhan kind of people or maybe someone wants to start some startup to have one small unit where this uh, like take example of compost, like the small unit, which can handle one ton of waste, food waste can produce maybe 400, 500 kg of compost every day. That could be sellable. That could be maybe uh, if it is not sellable, maybe government has to fund those kind of facility, at least for a few years until unless uh, he, he'll get some revenue out of that. If it is not possible, compost a small unit of five tons, ten tons biogas unit. But until uh, the waste uh, receiving need to be a com confirmed, like they should receive the waste. So if that kind of facility, if it is possible to run by the even the any startup also with, which can start, which is already is happening in most of the part of India. So maybe I think we can get the extension of such kind of work in future. Okay, so I think uh, along the same line was the last uh, question which just came up as well. So yeah, your uh, thought, uh, uh, Mr. Bhan, and then if you stay, you have to, Mr. Bhan, you want to add something to that? So, so I think I agree on most of the things because, uh, you know, uh, food uh, handling the food waste or minimization of the food waste it is one of the major things as, uh, you know, from decarbonization perspective, because once it lands into the landfill, it is one of the major components of generation of methane and, uh, you know, uh, the whole uh, uh, issue of climate change as well. Uh, so, yes, there is a requirement. Uh, I feel that there needs to be a balance of two things. Uh, one, uh, as uh, uh, you know, uh, Madam Day also mentioned that there needs to be a reduction of food waste. Uh, the repackaging also needs to be done in the right way. Uh, for example, in most of few of, for example, I was in Netherlands way back when I was studying. So there were restaurants where you cannot waste food. If you were going to waste food, you are supposed to pay for it, or you are supposed to ensure that. Uh, you know, uh, you pack it and you take it with you. So these kind of systems need to be developed plus the processing of it. So there needs to be a combination of both so that it's a win-win situation and we reach the net zero target soon. So Ms. Day, any closing statement from you before we close? Yeah, uh, I agree with both my panelists as well as you that uh, yes, we need to repackage it uh, as a uh, as a net zero objective and um, because uh, some I, I mean I don't like to use too many you know, jargons but sometimes it helps to use jargon at the right place to hit at the right point so yes uh, public sentiment has to be aroused in terms of uh, achieving net zero and linking food waste and it's uh, whether uh, right from you know production food loss, food waste, and again, once food becomes waste, it's treatment. So we need to reinforce the classic uh, pyramid that we have, our seven Rs. Um, and of course, yes, linking it to climate change and net zero is very, very crucial. Okay, I think that's uh, with this thoughts, I think we can close it today. We can discuss this forever, isn't it? <laughs> with, uh, this is such a pertinent topic and a hot topic. A lot of things needs to be done at India level, also at the global level. So we can continue, but uh, we try to um, respect the time. Uh, so we already have almost 70 minutes uh, uh, for the webinar today. So again, uh, uh, thank you. And I think I will hand it over to 